<laughs> Welcome aboard Blue Moon. I'm Jillian, and this is Jonas. We live aboard our 1978 Catalina 30 sailboat. Join us while we explore the West Coast by land and sea, while living in our tiny floating home. If you enjoy these videos, hit the like button and subscribe to our channel for more content. Thanks for watching. Hey everyone, welcome to another video. Today we're gonna to be talking about the cost of this sailboat that we've been living on. We've had a lot of questions from you guys about the cost of living aboard as well as how much the, the boat costs, how much the boat costs, what we put into it. We're gonna do a two part series talking about the cost of living aboard. So this is gonna be the first video where we're gonna focus on the cost of the boat and the cost to refit it. And then we're gonna make a second video about the ongoing cost of living on the boat and how it relates to the cost of living in a building or in, like in an apartment or a, a room. So if you're only curious about our total cost of purchasing the boat and also refitting, then we'll give that to you right up front. Then we'll go into the details of how we went about purchasing the boat in addition to what we put into it to make it live aboard ready. The total cost of purchasing and refitting our Catalina 30 came in just under $13,000. In American, that's about 10,000 American dollars. I think. Just over 10,000. Just over 10,000. So we're gonna start with the cost breakdown of purchasing the boat itself. It was listed on Kijiji for $15,500. That was way out of my price range, but I figured I could get the guy down a little bit. So I called him up, we had a few discussions, we had some complications during the process, <laughs> but finally- <laughs> What kind of complications? Um, as in, as I was making a negotiation, the boat was sold and then not sold on me. Very emotional experience. Long story short, we agreed upon a price of $10,000. I put a $1,000 deposit down with a conditional acceptance that I could go and see the boat before making a final purchase. From where I was at the time, it was a 12 and a half hour drive to get to where the boat was. I went to see the boat and it was in much worse condition than I had thought. But I was kind of happy about that. <laughs> in a way, structurally, the boat seemed like it was in really good shape. It had been out the year prior. It had some work done. The previous owner got the bottom paint redone. So I was really happy about that. My main goal was to get, obviously, a structurally sound boat. The previous owner just didn't have the time to come down and see the boat. I think it was visited maybe once a year. It was very obvious that the boat had been neglected for the last few years. The interior was ultimately just really dirty. Tons of mildew, the roof was black with soot, just from, from, the... from the fireplace and from the alcohol stove. The batteries were all dead and, and old, so they weren't holding their charge as well as they should have. And one of the major things, which I think had actually deterred a lot of previous potential buyers. Potential buyers. Because the boat was sold, well, an offer had been accepted, right, on the boat? An offer was accepted and then retracted. And yeah, this boat had been for sale, I think for like over a year. So for some reason, people weren't wanting this boat. This sounds like a bad cliffhanger, like you're about to tell them why <laughs> yeah. we shouldn't have bought it. No, but it, was so good, far, it was a good purchase. <laughs> it's been a very good purchase. But yeah, the main sort of elephant in the room, if you will, was that the boat was unable to shift. So it was stuck in neutral. Therefore, we were also unable to take it for a sea trial, which is a little risky. Mm -hmm. um, but I basically just decided to take that risk. What I was told was that the shifting cable had seized. And that's fine, right? You replace the shifting cable, no problem. But it was it was a risk to take because the previous owner had told me that people were worried about the transmission. And that is a big risk to take because transmissions 
are not mm. cheap. Luckily, the previous owner did show us that it shifted just by manually shifting it with his hand, reaching into the engine compartment. I had no idea that the shifting cable had seized until I had driven 12 and a half hours, took a ferry, and was walking down the dock to the boat. So it was last minute information. Last minute information, yet crucial information. I was a little upset about that. I took a long road trip to get there. I was serious about buying this boat. And when I got there, I was told the boat essentially didn't move. So I was, that was concerning. That was very concerning. But at the end of the day, I decided to take that risk. And I ended up agreeing on a price lower than we had agreed upon before arriving. So the final price we agreed upon was $9,000 for the boat. At the end of the day, that ended up being a really good deal. It gave me a lot more playing room within my budget for the boat, so that was really nice. So the grand total of the boat after sales tax and all the transfer of ownership type stuff was $10,080 for our 1978 Catalina 30. One thing we forgot to mention is that the, the purchase cost of the boat included the tender and also a six horsepower outboard motor. So that was the purchase price, but a lot of labor and money went into maintenance and refitting the boat so it was liveaboard ready and so we could actually take the boat out. So now we're going to discuss the cost to refit the boat. This is the cost of all the items that were purchased to make the space livable and to get the engine and the boat ready for for traveling. When we first purchased the boat, there were two house batteries and one starting battery, all of which were old and I, I wasn't confident that they were going to hold their charge. Since we were off grid at the time, I just made the decision to buy three brand new batteries. So two deep cycle marine house batteries and one starter battery. So the cost for three new batteries was $540. The next thing was a new water pump and accumulator, which was around $200. I also purchased a 100 watt solar panel. That was about $210, and that was my only power source during the summer. The next item that was purchased was new foam for the V-Birth mattresses. I went to a foam cutting shop. I'd actually phoned a few different shops in Vancouver who specialize in marine foam, and they quoted me like over a thousand dollars to to cut new mattresses for the V-Birth. I went to a local surplus store and bought a queen size mattress of six inch, 10 year foam. 10 year means it's supposed to last for 10 years if you're on the foam, like sleeping on the foam every day. We wanted to get a, a fairly high quality piece of foam because we're living here um, all the time. You could get foam for a lot cheaper if it was thinner or if you don't want it to last as long. So if you were just using the boat on the weekends or for occasional trips, you probably wouldn't need foam like that. But I bought a queen size piece of this foam and it worked out well because the the horizontal length of the, the like the width of the V-Birth is the same as the length of a queen size bed. I think it's about 80 inches. So I only had them cut triangular pieces off the end of the foam. And I think that was 15 bucks. So the total for the cost of the mattress was around 400. Canadian. I think you could actually really comfortably get away with four inch foam. Yeah. Our bed up there is really comfortable. Extra comfortable. Um, and the other thing to consider, which we didn't think about at the time, is the more inches of foam, the less headroom. inches of headroom. Yeah. So if I were to do it again, I would experiment with the four inch foam. Yeah. Yeah. I think we could have gotten away with less and maybe a firmer foam as well. We would probably get four inches of a more rigid foam and it would give me a couple more inches above my head <laughs> in the bed. We haven't made uh, cushion covers for it. Which we really want to. Yeah, we should. Um, we're gonna try to make those ourselves because again, to have someone make it. I phoned an upholstery shop and again, the quote was for 400 or $500 to have the cushion covers made. Yeah. So that wasn't gonna work. <laughs> Another item that was purchased was a battery charger. It wasn't until we were on shore power that we noticed the battery charger that had come with the boat when it was purchased didn't work. So we replaced that and that was $150. So the battery charger we have right now is we just keep it inside the cabin. We plug it into an outlet and we have it on the eight amp setting. So it slowly draws power and keeps our house and starting battery full. 
While we're on shore power. While we're on shore power. When it's winter, we don't have enough through the solar panel to charge the batteries. Mm -hmm. So this just keeps them all nice and full. Even though we're on shore power, we still have systems such as the water pump and some of the lights that mm -hmm. are still running off the batteries. So it's important to keep those topped up. Another item that was purchased to give us electricity during the summer when we were off grid was a inverter. So it's a 750 watt yes. inverter. It has some USB ports and two uh, AC like 110 plugins. Plugins, And that was $170. Mm -hmm. Those were sort of the really big purchases that we made. And next is sort of our miscellaneous fund and that's ongoing. This one we just kind of guessed as to what our initial investment was. Mm -hmm. So it came out to around $500. And that includes carbon monoxide detector, smoke detector, all new fire, fire extinguishers, extinguishers, things that we picked up from hardware stores and all over the place just to make this boat nicer. <laughs> um, so for example, we have a solar fan in the V-Berth, which is great for helping keep airflow through the V-Berth. That broke very soon after purchasing the boat. You don't want to be playing with it too much. Yeah. I think I may have messed with the mechanism. Don't stick your fingers in the fan, please. Yeah, it doesn't hurt. <laughs> didn't, I wanted to test to see if it would hurt my finger, and it did not. <laughs> but I don't think it was good for the fan. Something happened. It didn't work. <laughs> I tried fixing it, but I also didn't put that much effort into it. This one's also nicer. The old one was metal, um, and it was starting to rust. So our new one is white plastic. I think it looks way nicer, mm -hmm. and it's just a little better. The next thing was lighting. And we experimented with lighting a little bit. When we got the boat, none of the lights worked. So that was sort of an urgent need. We initially bought these little puck lights, which are battery operated and you just push yeah, but, to turn on. Yeah, like a push, a push button, a push button light. light with adhesive on the back. And we stuck them, I think seven or eight of them on the roof yeah. in here. And for the first day, first couple days oh they, they were, were amazing they were great we thought like problem solved I mean we had never had light in here so yeah no, you can only go up they were way better than using the flashlights they got really dull really quickly and the solution to that problem was putting in new batteries but I cannot justify putting in new batteries every three days like that's such a waste of, yeah. of batteries like that's so bad for the environment <laughs> yeah way better than nothing but because they got so dim like it wasn't, you couldn't read or do work yeah. with them. Like if I was up late at night and journaling or reading or something, I would still have a flashlight in my hand because I just couldn't see enough from the light. We actually hardwired in some DC lighting for the boat. All of our lights right now are LED because they use virtually no power, which is really great. I'll give you five bucks if you can tell me what LED stands for. Lead. I don't know. Actually. Luminescent effervescence deficiency. <laughs> I think that's right. Yeah, we'll look it up later. But Definitely luminescent. I think that was right. Uh, <laughs> I don't think it is luminescent. And it's just definitely not. Anyway. Light emitting diode. I don't know. Oh, that might be a good one. That was a huge upgrade for us. Now we have like a ton of lights because we have AC yeah. and DC lights, but you can never have enough lighting. No. And that, that was really nice too. The lights that were originally in the boat were really gross. They were, some of them were taken out. Some of them were like cracked and some of them were literally falling off. So that was a huge upgrade for us yeah. to get those lights out of there and the new lights in. Things like the hatch adjuster was broken up in the V-Berth. We needed small parts and hardware. I replaced the mooring lines on the boat because I noticed those were becoming Chafe. chafed, which is a big no-no. Um, that included... No-no. No-no. Some little plumbing modifications repairs. and repairs. Like corroded sinks, corroded taps, that kind of thing. What is that? the all-encompassing miscellaneousness. Should we move on to the big ticket item? Yeah. Now, the biggest single expense after purchasing Blue Moon was the labor cost for replacing the shifting cable. This one was expensive. And 
the worst part about it is that I probably could have done it myself. It was quite literally just replacing a cable. But I didn't have the confidence to do that. I had a lot of other things going on and this was something that was really important. I wanted it done right. So I hired a local marine mechanic to do the labor for me. I purchased the cable for $42. The cost of labor was $675. That was much more than I was expecting. I was unable to get a quote ahead of time. It was turned out to be a learning experience for both of us. I was very much working with this individual and we did it together, which was really great learning experience for me. From what I had looked up and seen online, it's a three hour project. This took us, I believe, nine hours. If anything, I'm just a little emotional about the experience. Sometimes you just gotta bite the bullet because I wanted it done right. That sort of brings us to the labor aspect of things, which I did besides the shifting cable, Jonas and I, and with some help from my family, we did all of the labor on this boat. Yeah, I spent, you know, probably three months. I moved onto the boat and I basically just worked away at things every day as much as I could. I really enjoyed it, um, but that was also a really huge cost saving thing. Mm -hmm. When you do the labor yourself, you're kind of just paying yourself to do it, basically. Yeah. We were very lucky that we were able to do, that Jillian was able to do a lot of the labor herself. If you had to take time off work to do this, it would be much more expensive for you if you're leaving your job and and missing out on pay. This was all happening in the summer of 2020, so right in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic here in Canada and around the world. Mm -hmm. So we were just really fortunate to have the time to be able to contribute to this project. And that makes a big difference. So we recognize that not everybody is able to take time off work. Finding the time to do the labor yourself might be a really difficult thing for certain people. It's a lot cheaper than paying someone else to do it, for sure. Yeah. Well, and like, you've, I've, I think if you want to do something, you can find the time to do that. Mm -hmm. Whether it, you know, I, I wasn't solely working on the boat. So I think, yeah, you can find the time, whether it be in the evenings after work or in the mornings before work. Yeah, I think, I think it's very doable. The one thing that I learned about purchasing this boat is that it's an ongoing process yeah, and nothing, it, nothing is ever finished nothing's ever finished like we will always be working and maintaining this boat and if you're not into that sorry to break the news to you but if you are like i i really love it if you don't like maintenance don't buy a boat <laughs> mm -hmm. you end up expecting to spend quite a bit of time every week just keeping things at a base level and then if you're trying to make improvements it, it can take a lot of time yeah, and luckily I really love that. I love having a project on the go. And so that's fun for me. Obviously that's not for everyone, but I genuinely enjoy doing that. So initially I scrubbed this boat from top to bottom. It was full of mildew, soot, and honestly just like dirt. Like it was really gross. Oh, the other thing is, this is a PSA, public service announcement. If you plan on doing anything in a marine environment or an aquatic environment, do not use hardware that will rust. Please. <laughs> this boat was full of rusty hardware and it's not because that's the way it is. Some things you can't cut costs on and that is stainless steel. Or I think there's like another one, maybe like zinc coated or something like that. It's anything that won't rust. Just use anything that won't rust and make sure it's not going to rust. Like, yes, it's a lot more expensive, but if you use other hardware, you're just going to be replacing it, like, really quickly. We typically try and be really careful about seawater getting on our, like, tools and stuff, like the metal yeah. part of tools. I left our old paint scraper out one night and it was rusty, I think, the next day. Please you use stainless steel. As much as possible, we try and do things the right way the first time. And obviously this is a huge learning experience and that's not always gonna happen. When I first purchased this boat, I did not know half of what I know now and I still have so much to learn. Mm. But one thing that we found really valuable was asking for help and asking for advice. Yeah, we got a, we got a huge amount of help 
we had a lot of assistance from people who knew what they were doing mm -hmm. and our neighbors in the bay were super nice um, and they gave us lots of tips and information and thanks so much to everyone who's been helping us because we couldn't mm -hmm. have done most of this stuff uh, yeah without you the grand total for the cost of this boat getting it to where we could live on it was 13,000 Canadian plus months and months of labor on Jillian's part and lots and lots of help from family from our neighbors and we really can't put a price on all that because we've learned so much if you have any questions or if we missed anything or you want more information feel free to leave comments for us we really like reading the comments and answering them in our next video we're going to talk about the cost of living on a sailboat the ongoing costs uh, so our mortgage the liveaboard fees what we pay for our showers and laundry just as a teaser we've been surprised at how affordable it is we're going to make some comparisons to living in this city in a house or an apartment jill and i are spending far less than we used to and we feel that this lifestyle might be a lot more affordable than people realize thanks for watching and we'll see you in our next video